Hey guys, welcome to D1 <laughs> Softball Podcast presented by S2 Cognition. I'm Gray Robertson. That is Tara Henry. We have 16 teams remaining, Tara, in the NCAA tournament. And what a wild regionals weekend it was. And I'm going to be honest, what a wild regionals Sunday it was. Because the first two days outside of the story in LA, which we will talk about, kind of mundane. The seeded teams held serve. Things were kind of going according to plan. Then Sunday, things got really wacky. You know, the whole weekend was wild uh, in general. I just want to say hello to everybody that's hopped on. Uh, I see our chat's already already going wild over there. But, yeah, I mean, I think we say this every year. Uh, it's just great to have postseason softball. It's great to see which players, which teams step up in the big moments. And incredible to see the parody across the country and just see some great games that we were able to watch uh, throughout the weekend. So much to dive into. We've got some phenomenal guests joining us in just a little bit. Stacy Newman Denise, the head coach at San Diego State, moving on to Supers, will be joining us in just a little bit, along with Silent Rain Espinoza from the Washington Huskies. Uh, if you did not catch the final game of regional play, you missed a lot. Just being honest, there was a lot going on in Seattle, Tara. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and if you did miss it, I encourage you to actually go back and watch that game because uh, it looked like McNeese had that thing wrapped up in a bow and we're heading to supers and just to see Washington and that fight. And I think there is just a, a collective belief with that offense. And we'll get to speak to, to silent rain Espinoza later in the podcast, but Incredible to see Washington pull through there in Seattle. A couple of funky things happening with the weather. Uh, you know, you always see the little um, cotton uh, floating in the air in Seattle. What a beautiful place to play. But you're right. If you did not watch that game, I encourage you to go back uh, and head on to, to ESPN and watch that replay. Okay, that was one of many, many regionals <laughs> that we will do. Lead off is basically the whole bracket. Let's do it. So we're going to more or less just kind of go through the bracket and talk about each regional, but we have to start with the one that is on the very, very bottom right, and that's the Los Angeles regional. Uh, last year, when Florida State was upset in regionals by Mississippi State, there was conversation about whether that was the biggest upset in regionals history. And Tara, UCLA going 0-2 is as, as stunning a result as I can remember in a very long time. And I, I think there's a larger conversation to be had about – the I'm going to be quite honest, uh, even though UCLA probably should have won the game, the unfairness of the best rated four seed going to the number two overall seed. That's something that we can, I'm sure, touch on a little bit later. But bottom line, the Bruins are out and they were out by Saturday night, which I don't think anybody in the world would have predicted. You know, I think we were all in shock. Uh, you know, I think across the country, we did not expect the Bruins to go. Uh, 0 and 2. The Bruins did go 0 and 2 back in 2012. The last time that did happen, uh, lost to Hofstra and Florida State. And then I think 2007 was the team I was on, arguably the, the toughest loss for the Bruins since then. Uh, when LMU, uh, shout out Sam Fisher and her Lions, uh, and Tariah Mim Flowers, which we can talk about LMU in a second, um, you know, came into to that regional. So huge upset. Uh, you know, the Bruins just look flat and. Sometimes that happens. I'm not going to sit here and, and make any excuses as to, to why they didn't win the, win the ball game. But, you know, the key to winning in the postseason is, you know, what team gets hot and who can who can execute uh, the little things. And, you know, that was tough for the Bruins throughout the weekend. And I think you're right, Gray. That was a tougher regional than maybe I think we all looked at. And, and I think that was overlooked. And, you know, I watched Liberty play there. I, in the regular season and dot what she did with that squad earlier before conference play really prepared liberty to to go into that region and ultimately uh deal the final blow to the bruins and then we'll get to stacy denouvman uh, uh stacy newman denise just put her two nest names together uh and uh, talk about san diego state and what she's been able to do with that program since taking over uh, at the helm there but yeah, tough, tough go for the Bruins. And even on my end, I'm not really a homer, but that one was a tough pill to swallow uh, just by the way they lost. And, and you know, 
I, I know how that feels and, and my heart goes out to them. But, you know, this is why we play the game. Uh, and, and I tweeted it earlier this week. The game doesn't know who's supposed to win. Uh, and, you know, former head coach Sue Inquish, she'd always remind us that. So uh, that that is evident in that Los Angeles regional. And um, congratulations to the Aztecs getting out of there. Absolutely. Congratulations to Grand Canyon picking up the historic win for their program. Congratulations to Liberty for having that moment. Just just an incredible, incredible game against the Bruins on Saturday. And then, like you said, San Diego State finishing the job. Uh, and one last little nugget on the Bruins, you know, three runs in two games, all were yeah. driven in by Megan Grant. And it was, I think, surprising to see how much overall – the UCLA offense struggled in this regional. And I think it's a testament to actually the, the quality of pitching that they faced in this Los Angeles regional. Again, I don't think we necessarily respected the difficulty of this regional because a lot of people are like, ah, it's UCLA. They'll be fine. Yeah. And they were not fine. <laughs> no. And it had the, like, as, as UCLA dropped that first game to GCU, it did have the feeling of, you know, last year's Florida state regional, uh, it, when they lost to Mississippi State, you started to feel that. And again, offense was stagnant, uh, inability to pr produce runs and, and just really, you know, look like they were back on their heels. Uh, weren't attacking pitches, weren't taking, you know, good swings other than, like you said, uh, the rookie uh, in Megan Grant. But tough loss for the Bruins, but opens up a ton of pro opportunities for both San Diego State uh, and Utah, which we'll get into. Yeah, why don't we look at the other side while we're down on the uh, bottom right portion of the bracket if you've got one handy like I do. Uh, Utah does come out of Salt Lake City. It was not easy, but they didn't drop a game. Ole Miss certainly put up a fight, especially in the regional final. Uh, I think really disappointing showing for Baylor, who just couldn't get over the various injuries that have really yeah. dampened the latter part of their season. But Utah... I mean, hey, you win the Pac-12 championship, you're the 15 seed, and now thanks to an upset on the other side, the Utes are hosting a super this upcoming weekend. A phenomenal story. I mean, what a turnaround uh, for Utah. And I want to give a shout out, obviously, to Southern Illinois, who I think uh, played a really incredible regional. The Salukis uh, were fun to watch. I think I had my eye on a couple games and kept seeing uh, the Salukis coming back there, uh, you know, gave Utah a run for their money in that 11-9 win for, for Utah in that first game. Uh, and then again, uh, against Baylor, I, they were they had an incredible fight. I was really, really impressed with them. But I agree with you, Gray. I think it's tough for Baylor to not have uh, a Binford in the circle, which obviously they lost earlier in the season, uh, and an or and Dari Orm. So I think you know that was that was a tough thing for for them to overcome. And Ole Miss put a put up a fight too. And I had Ole Miss getting out of that regional. I thought they might maybe got hot at the right time, but Utah showing uh, that they're the real deal and. You know, I wouldn't be surprised now if we see them uh, at the Women's College World Series. And, you know, we had Amy Hogue on the podcast last week. And just how can you not root for Amy Hogue and the Utes and, and what she's been able to do there uh, with that squad? Yeah, she was absolutely delightful. And so is this team. And I think in the postseason, you have to be able to show that you can win games in a variety of ways. And like you talked about, Southern Illinois put up a big fight in every game that they played over the weekend. Utah had to win shootouts and they had to win lower scoring matchups. And if you are capable of winning in a variety of fashions in this tournament, you have a chance to go pretty deep. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And, and that's, that's what's going to help them moving forward. When you win those cl close tight games, that's, only going to make them better uh, heading into supers and really prepare them, hopefully, uh, you know, to, to go at it. And again, against this really tough uh, Aztec San Diego State team uh, in supers, that's going to be a fun one to watch. And obviously, congratulations to Utah for, for hosting uh, a supers in Salt Lake City. Which will begin Friday against San Diego State at 10 o'clock Eastern time on ESPNU. We have the dates, we have the times, and we have the game one television schedules. And I know at least who's coming to Tuscaloosa, but we don't know the full TV crews as of yet. Which uh, which super do you want to go to next, Tara? Which which little quadrant? We're going supers. I, I, I've got all the regionals uh, on this piece of paper here. Should we talk about Norman and what happened in Norman? Let's do it. So so we're going to see Oklahoma and Clemson and Supers. And the reason the Sooners are there, Tara, is because 
my gosh, just all the home runs that a team can hit, Oklahoma hit against Cal, and a, a really, really impressive showcase. Honestly, Tara, it reminded me a lot of last year as we were doing the scoreboard updates on the radio broadcast. I was like, shoot, do you remember what OU did to AM in the regional final a season ago? And we basically got a carbon copy against Cal uh, in uh, the Sunday matchup between the Sooners and the Bears. The Sooner is leaving no doubt who is the number one team in the country right now. And you're right. Seven different Sooners had home runs on the weekend, uh, three of them with multiple home runs. But can't say enough about th that offense and that pitching staff. And excellence and dominance over time is just so difficult. And, and we're seeing that with some of these larger seeds like UCLA uh, dropping a, a regional. I, I think it's so difficult. And we don't give enough credit to – what that staff does year in and year out. It's not only bringing in players, which we can talk about the transfer portal, we know that is, but a prov like providing a culture uh, and a framework for that team to succeed. Uh, they just do it year in and year out, and that's not a tough thing to do, or that is a tough thing to do. Uh, they are just so efficient. Uh, I mean, <laughs> they are a killing machine. And one of the things that people say to describe Alabama football is joyless murder ball. And I feel like that's what <laughs> happens when Oklahoma plays. It's literally joyless murder ball because every hitter is murdering the ball out beyond the fence. And it's certainly joyless for the opponent. And I think that Oklahoma just again proved why they were the favorite, uh, like we talked about, why they uh, are, are trying to make history and why they have a great chance to do it once we get to Oklahoma City. Um, I thought that otherwise, you know, Missouri, solid weekend. Missouri and Cal seem to be pretty even squads. Uh, and I thought Hofstra, all things considered, actually played okay against Oklahoma in the first game of that regional. But uh, we knew that the Sooners were, were just flat better than everybody here, and it was proven out on the field. Yeah, and you know Chelsea Spencer at Cal, obviously taking over at the helm there. Former former Cal Bear herself, player, uh, getting Cal back into a regional and getting some regional wins. Like you said, a big win over Missouri for the Bears. That's going to give some good momentum to Cal Bears and get them back to, uh, you know, a team that a decade ago was consistently at the Women's College World Series. So again, that wasn't an easy regional either for OU and a, they just made it look easy. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, it is, you know, it, it is what it is. Like you can say what you want about the Sooners. They are just that good. Uh, and we're going to keep saying it until they're not, but they are, they are just that good, Gray. Yeah. And I, I think to your point as well, we've talked about two Pac-12 teams that have been moving upwards, Utah and Cal. And, and years like this are going to continue to help that upward trajectory. Uh, obviously, the future is so bright for the Utes, uh, and they're still playing this year. But Cal, to go from what they were two years ago to last year to, to this year, I'm really excited to see what the Bears can do in the Pac-12 next season. Uh, so Oklahoma and Supers will be paired with Clemson, who came out of the Clemson Regional. This one did go to an if game, and Valerie Cagle might have sewn up Player of the Year with her really impressive performance in the circle and at the plate against the Auburn Tigers, out-dueling Matty Pinta a couple times in the regional. And I'll tell you what, Clemson, OU is going to be a fascinating matchup because the Tiger team that I saw this weekend for the majority of the weekend was the best Clemson squad that I've watched in months. You know, Gray, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, you know, I was having this discussion about what was going to happen in this region or the super regional week of OU and Clemson. And I said, listen, I, I was able to watch Clemson, you know, a few weeks ago in person and yes, they were good, but the team that we saw and for the, the ability to come back from Bree Ellis and Auburn uh, ending that three run home run and Maddie Penta and doing what Maddie Penta does in the circle, uh, they showed some grit. They showed some fight. We were, nervous if they weren't tested enough like we were if they weren't battle tested early in the season and i think we're seeing a clemson team that if valerie cagle can keep the ball down in the zone uh, and mix that up and off speed she could potentially give you know some trouble to the ou offense they're gonna have to be very very smart in using that pitching staff do you bring millie thompson in after you go through the lineup once uh, is it 
you know, go through the lineup once, bring in a Millie Thompson, and then go back to Kegel. I think they're going to have to be a little bit crafty uh, in order to keep that OU offense uh, off balance. But again, I think it's going to be a, a nice showdown in Norman and, and something I was considering about going out to think that's how excited I am about this matchup. Ooh, wait, uh, can we get a tease? Where are you going this weekend? Or you want to save it for later in the show? Uh, I'm not quite sure where I'm going this weekend. Uh, obviously, normally stay at ho home uh, for super. So that's going to change. So figuring out uh, where I'm going to be this weekend, uh, I'll let you know. Okay, I will I will keep my texts <laughs> open. All right, so let's just go straight down. The, the next Super that we'll see is Stanford and Duke. Uh, looking at Palo Alto, the Cardinal come out of it, demolished Florida a couple times. I know that there was a lot of drama and controversy involving that final game. Tim Walton gets ejected for uh, what I think was a, a pretty bad strike zone, and maybe that's something we can talk about too. I thought there was a lot of conversation about strike zones across the country in regional play, but it was good to see when looking at the actual results, the Stanford offense come alive to back up the pitching. Now, part of my question is, did the offense come alive because they were facing Florida pitching or have they truly figured it out? I think we'll find out this weekend. I think that's exactly what I was going to say, Gray. Um, you know, Stanford, a ton of offense this past weekend. Even I was surprised and and watching uh, how many solid uh, base hits they were able to get through. And again, we've talked about the Florida pitching staff and uh, the issues they've had there. But, you know, this is the type of momentum that the Cardinal can use heading into Super Regionals. And that, that regional against Duke, I think that Super is going to be uh, one to keep an eye on. Is it going to be a pitcher's duel between the two? Uh, how How is Jess Alster going to use that pitching staff? Is Nija going to, you know, throw one game? I think another interesting matchup. But in terms of Tim Walton, in terms of the Florida Gators, can't say enough about Skylar Wallace and what she did this, this season. But, you know, the pitching, it just, it wasn't going to get them through. Uh, and we thought potentially the offense could carry uh, that team. But, we saw a Stanford squad that is hungry and, and ready uh, to get after it. And, and really after I think getting quite snubbed by the selection committee uh, heading through to, to play a tough Duke team, but got a little chip on their shoulder. Hey, and a, a tip of the cap as well to Long Beach state and LMU who put up incredible fights. Throughout. Jenna Perez. Oh, and how about the beach? You know, we talked about Stanford's offense popping off. That first game was just one nothing, so yeah. it, it was it was tight top to bottom in Palo Alto. Oh yeah, the beach. I, I watched Long Beach win the Big West title uh, last week. So Shannon had to add in the circle for Long Beach, hold you know holding Stanford to just a, a run and. Hats off to to Long Beach because you would have said two weeks ago we didn't think they would even be in the tournament uh, and to be playing in uh, Palo Alto in Stanford and, and to to giving them a, a close run for it. Uh, yeah, congratulations to them, LMU and Florida, uh, for their incredible seasons. So Stanford's matched up with Duke in Supers. Duke comes out of a Durham Regional defeating Charlotte in comeback fashion on Sunday. Kind of the most Duke of Duke weekends, Tara. <laughs> they just they just found ways to win. They were not pretty games, but as I've always said, in the postseason, doesn't matter how you do it, just that you do it. And Duke found ways to to get victories. Yeah, finding ways to win and, and mixing really Jayla Wright and, and Cassidy Curd. I I'm so impressed with Cassidy Curd in the circle. I, she does not act like a freshman and comes in in big moments uh, and gets big strikeouts and really attacks the zone. And I think we're also seeing a Duke offense that's just getting done and a, a ton of rookies in, in looking at Amina uh, Vega and Donna Jennings and what that Duke freshman class has been able to do just really impressed. So I think it's a good mix of, uh, you know, uh, some young kids on that squad uh, mixed with some veterans. And again, another super where I think pitching is going to be the key and who can get, uh, you know, timely hitting. I think it's going to stay uh, low, low scoring in, in both of those um, contests uh, for Duke and uh, Stanford. Forget just pitching. How about freshman pitching? Curd, yeah, right. Kennedy, fire me up. Let's go. Incredible. Like what, what? 
I mean, you're, we're looking at maybe a, a Friday. Are there are the Friday game? Um, we're looking yeah, at Friday, Friday at Friday at noon Eastern time on ESPN two. Yeah, looking at a Friday potential Nigel Kennedy against a Cassidy Kurt. I mean, two incredible rookie arms in the circle. So again, we're seeing the youth come through and really stepping up in big moments, and that's just that's what it's all about. That's just so fun to see. All right, next up going down is Northwestern coming to Alabama. We'll start in the Tuscaloosa Regional where the story was Jayla Torrance. And I think, you know, we were talking about it on the air yesterday. The ideal scenario for Alabama this weekend was to find a way to win a regional without Montana Fouts having to throw a pitch. And Jayla Torrance made that possible, did not allow a run in 18 and two-thirds innings in regional play. Uh, the offense certainly struggled on Sunday, and I know every one of those players would say exactly that, but Ali Shipman had the key hit in the seventh to make sure that Alabama season continued. And honestly, Tara, this was one of those regionals where the first couple days, kind of boring overall game-wise. You know, there were a couple upsets, but nothing super, super tight. Sunday had all the drama. Oh, and it's, you know, I I see some comments uh, about Middle Tennessee, uh, you know, Braden in there. I love watching uh, the MTSU shorts up. And I can't say enough about Middle Tennessee because, uh, you know, winning Conference USA tournament, getting out of that. And really, you know, I people call me like, what's going on with MTSU? I said, listen, um, I, I've seen some some teams across the country. We're talking about parity, uh, and I'm not a huge fan. I, I'm just going to say it, Gray. I'm not a huge fan of saying mid major. Uh, I, I know that's the art mid majors, but uh, I would argue that we're looking at a time in our sport where we're seeing teams like a Middle Tennessee do more with you know less funding, uh, and that's incredible to me. Uh, to, Great coaching, great recruiting, uh, and getting it done, rolling their sleeves up and getting it done. Uh, so uh, back to Middle Tennessee and Alabama. Uh, but in terms of Alabama, we were worried about the offense. And I know that we talked about this, Gray. For Alabama to get through that regional without Montana Fouts in the circle, collectively the belief of the Alabama Crimson Tide, I can't say enough about what that means and and that momentum moving forward. Are we going to see Montana? You have a better idea than me, Gray, um, whether or not we're going to see her. But that shows you that I think the adversity going through that they went through uh, throughout the season uh, to to get out of that regional and and to advance to super shows you that Alabama, they've got some some of that fight that I I used to see a couple years ago. I'm not going to say which teams I'm going to mention, but I saw a little twinkle in the eyes when I I was there at that Ole Miss game in Oxford. And it, it was fun to watch Alabama Crimson Tide this past weekend and get it done when it wasn't easy. And that's what's the hard thing is to, to win when not everything's going your way either. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, shout out to Jayla. Uh, one little note on Allie Shipman. I, I, I just think the symmetry is so crazy in 2019 at Tennessee in a game against middle Tennessee, a collision at the plate tore her ACL and ended her season. It was a great freshman year. And then to be the one that got the hit yesterday, I, I think is, uh, just one of those softball story moments, you know, finding a way to come back and, and get one last jab at Middle Tennessee. Um, I will also say Jayla Torrance was great, but right there with her all weekend was Gretchen Mead for Middle Tennessee State. And, and she is a player that their head coach, Jeff Breeden, talked about in the press conferences as one who didn't do much at all at the beginning of her career, but got better, got better, got better. Saw an increased role this season and was pitching the best softball of her career in the most important time of the year, six no hit relief innings in the conference USA tournament championship to get middle Tennessee to the Tuscaloosa regional. And then three and O in regionals, including two shutout wins of a central mm-hmm. Arkansas team that, that really surprisingly struggled in Tuscaloosa. I, and I think that was one of the biggest shockers uh, of the the weekend we really saw a central Arkansas team, which performed at a really high level throughout the entire season, really struggle in that regional. And uh, again, I was just, you know, Graham Hayes over on our site, we've got all your regional breakdowns for you. Uh, highlighting need. I was going to make sure that we, we got her in there, but great. You took care of it. Um, you can head on over and take a look at all the regionals. If you need to be caught up, uh, if you missed maybe one or two games uh, on the weekend, but yes, 
uh, disappointed, disappointed uh, in uh, Central Arkansas and was was hoping that they could make a better run at, uh, for it. But again, that's what happens. Teams, certain teams get hot and certain teams, uh, the bats go cold or, uh, you know, unable to get things done in the circle. But, you know, congratulations to them as well on an incredible season because, you know, yesterday or the day before, whenever your team's eliminated, it doesn't define uh, you as a player, you as a person, you as a, uh, as a season. Uh, we have to look at these things as a whole and uh, incredible season for Central Arkansas and, and and really just doing a nice job staying consistent uh, over the season. But yeah, tough loss this weekend. I was really shocked because we had all them. We had everybody on the staff, but Brady Vernon uh, picked uh, Central Arkansas to get out of the regional. So Brady Vernon, I know the Crimson Tide are loving Brady at this moment because he's the one, the only one that chose Alabama to get out of that regional. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yeah. SID Nathan Sheehan had some fun with with, uh, with everybody on staff after that. Um, and I will say it does set up that interesting super with Northwestern coming up this weekend. Uh, a small subplot was the 2019 National Freshman of the Year battle between Montana Fouts and Danielle Williams that Danielle Williams won. A lot of people thought Montana should have won. Well, there's a chance they're going to face off this weekend because Northwestern comes out of Evanston. And I was, again, really impressed by the Wildcats who just – very similar to a lot of teams that we talked about, find ways to win in a variety of manners. Well, did you just say Montana's throwing this weekend? Or are you confirming that she's throwing I this weekend? I said that there is a chance. Oh, okay. I knew she was available yesterday. Coach okay. Murphy did say oh, she was okay. available to throw yesterday. So there is a, a chance that we could see a Montana Fouts versus a Danielle Williams, which in itself is an epic matchup uh, for a super regional. And, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about Northwestern and their super seniors, which includes Danielle Williams. And can't say enough about Jordan Rudd. We, we had her on the podcast, I think, just a week ago, right, Gray? Uh, and there's something really special about Northwestern and their ability to to fight and come back and, and really overcome uh, some – large deficits uh, throughout the season. I don't know how they do it, but there's some magic uh, in that squad. Uh, and Jordan Rudd's a big part of that. So this is going to be another, like I, I look at our super regional matchups and I'm stoked. Like this is a, a year where we've got some, you know, actual, these are all women's called world series matchups uh, as, as what I'm looking at. Uh, and uh, again, we could have a pitcher's duel uh, in uh, Tuscaloosa. Should that happen? Absolutely. And uh, one more tip of the cap as well to Miami of Ohio, Brianna oh. Pratt had oh, to carry yeah. the load in that regional and, and they were one controversial play away from playing an if game in Evanston. I mean, they were, they were right there with Northwestern. And I swear every time um, I obviously watching loads of games at once, but what an offense over there. Every swing uh, taken for that Miami, Ohio squad up and down the lineup. I'm thinking that these are some good, good hacks. Like literally that was what was going on in my mind and uh, scrappy and, and fun to watch. And again, you're right, Gray, uh, putting up a fight there in Evanston uh, with obviously the Wildcats ultimately coming out on top there. But um, no, I was excited to see that. And my, and my, my Ohio, that's not the last we're going to hear from them. I, I think we're going to be talking about them a lot uh, heading into next season uh, and, you know, postseason potential next year too. Yeah, and one last little nugget from Evanston, Kentucky, just uh, a a Jekyll and Hyde night and day, Friday and Saturday. Friday, they looked so good. I was thinking, this is the Kentucky team that we've been waiting for. And then Saturday, gave up all the runs to Northwestern, got run ruled by Miami of Ohio. I feel for our friend Kayla Kowalik, whose career came to an end like that. But it was a Kentucky team that was just marred by injuries in the circle, and the offense couldn't keep pace. Yeah, and, and like you said, at one point you're thinking, you know, again, a question marks about the pitching staff and when Schoonover was hurt in the middle of the season or Schoonover was hit in the middle of the season, uh, were they going to be able to bounce back? And, you know, watching Kayla Kowalik in her career, uh, you know, a player who I swear her jersey's always just covered in caked in dirt. And to see Kayla Kowalik, do what she did at Kentucky and love Kentucky with as what you can see, not only in her play and how she talks about being a wildcat. 
I can't say enough about her career. And I'm just really excited to see her not only for uh, in the pro league, but, you know, throughout potentially playing for team USA, uh, because we know that's happened before, but what an incredible uh, ambassador to the game and just one that we're, I'm going to miss watching or I'm going to miss watching her play play in a Wildcats uniform. And I'll flash this one up before we get to our cleanup hitter. Oh, 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 oh. That that home run off of what I have now found out is a basketball arena. I've been asking for years what that building is. My gosh. I, I apologize to Kelly Higby. I wish I had asked her to put the clip in. Because yes, yes. She could probably one of the it. more insane swings I, I've ever seen. I I I, I think... I think. The weekend as a whole, or I don't know if it was just yesterday, we saw so many yard, like, balls leave the yard. But in an instance, to see, I mean, that was on top of that basketball. I mean, Aaron Carter, she hit the ball. I mean, it's, 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 it's out of it's control. control. Yeah, so Kentucky season comes to an end, uh, unfortunately, in Evanston. And it's almost time, I think, Tara, to get to the cleanup hitter. Shall we? Yep. Let's do it. If I can find it. Here we go. Uh, Easy for me to find the transition because, uh, my gosh, there is no bigger story in college softball than everything that went down in Los Angeles and the team that rises up is San Diego State, Stacy Newman Denise, the head coach of the Aztecs, joins us here on the D1 Softball Podcast. Coach, welcome. Congratulations on reaching Supers. How are you? Is this real? Like, did this actually happen? Um, I, I am, I'm, I'm great. I mean, I, I think that goes without saying. Um, honestly, just really trying to soak in the moment and enjoy, enjoy what we just accomplished, and, um, and also start the process of getting ready for Utah. Um, You know, that's the thing I think that's even more wild is, you know, like we're going to a region that I think we can win. Um, You know, and I, not that I wouldn't say that anyways, but I, you know, and I have total respect for, for Amy Hogue and what she's done there and, and and what they're capable of. But I, I like, I like our chances. And um, if you told me I'd be sitting here talking, talking about this to this morning, you know, I, I had belief, but also, you know, you know that the, the cards are somewhat stacked against you when you go to that region and the teams that we had to play and face and 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 um, get past. But here we are. So I'm just still kind of in disbelief, but also just super proud of of my squad and the resilience we showed, the fight we showed, the um, performance, the the execution. The the I mean, we competed, we competed, and that's really all we can ask at this this time of year. And Nuvi, I don't know if you, if I don't know if my audio is still off. Is it still off, Gray? Or is it good? Okay, okay good. Um, so obviously, going back to Easton uh, and advancing to your first super as a uh, head coach at San Diego State, what what did that feel like uh, being at Easton and and being in a place that I know means so much to you? I mean, getting, you know, selection Sunday, seeing that's where we're going, you know, that's always mixed emotions. And I've had, we've, we've had our name called at Easton more than once. So we're, we're familiar with that in a, in a postseason setting. Obviously my first year as a head coach um, being on that field in that setting, but um, honestly, like my personal kind of goal for the weekend and really, especially as the weekend was going along and things were playing out the way they were playing out. And it was like, okay, we're in the driver's seat wow like this is this is insane i really just wanted to you know to practice what i was preaching with my team but of being where my feet are just like be in this moment enjoy this moment whatever the results end up being this is a life this is a core memory and for all of us myself included like this is my this is my first time doing this and so i was really like kind of cheesy but i was like really trying to sit back and almost like have my zen moment of just like taking in the scene, taking in the setting and and just looking around that place. It was like, wow, like not only is this happening for this program and for this university and for these women that I love and are so bought in and, and trusting of, of what we're doing, but I'm doing it at UCLA. Like this is just too poetic. It was 
um, I, I, I was, I was overcome with emotion. I just, I can't, I can't really put it into words how I was feeling. It was just overwhelming. Yeah. And, and to do it at UCLA against UCLA with Liberty and, and Dr. Dot Richardson also there, I don't know if you have a take on the, on the in-game <laughs> interview video, which was so hilarious. Did you see that? No, I didn't. <laughs> when, uh, I'll when, send uh, it to you. Richardson st stood a little bit in front of Kelly. I, I think. Uh, oh, I did. Really yes. Understand. I saw that. Yes. <laughs> Kelly. I was being interviewed and Dot was like, right yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, like totally blocking her view. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> oh, that was such good stuff. But in particular, when we look at the game action, uh, your pitching staff was incredible this week. And I, my girl, Allie Light from the FGCL has been tearing it up this year. And I was so happy to see her have success in the Los Angeles Regional. But what is it about these arms when they work together that make them so effective? You know, I, I love that um, I have the opportunity to kind of speak on the, I would say, evolution of pitching in our game. Um, you know, and not to say that there aren't still the the Catherine Sander Crocs who just go out and throw a perfect game, you know, like no big deal. But um, the reality is there's just not, she's a unicorn. There just aren't that many pitchers in this, in the game today that can beat these offenses three, four times through the lineup. Like it just doesn't, it's just not there. And, you know, I think as, as a mid-major program, um, especially it's fitting for us, you know, the same thing. Like we, we had Maggie Ballon a year ago. She was a seven inning pitcher, but, but she was a unicorn for us too. Um, and I don't say that with any disrespect to the pitchers that we have on our staff. I think it's, it's a, it's a, the, the way the game is going. It's where the game is going. And so to, for us to buy into that process of like, we're going to have multiple options. In a perfect world, they're different. So we've got some velo, you've got some upspin, you've got some downspin, you've got some change up, you've got some lefties and righties. And and then it's just, you know, my job as the pitching coach is to figure out how do these arms and these weapons match up with who we're facing and, and the offenses that we're facing and what they bring and what they do well and all those kinds of things. So I, I mean, Ali Light has obviously been our been our horse in, in terms of if we had a horse, um, she's been our go-to and and you know got the most innings and probably been in the most critical situations, but at the same time, like we've used our staff and we're going to use our staff. We're going to continue to use our staff. That's who we are. That's what's gotten us to this point. Um, you know, and I think that it's, I'll be honest, like this weekend that I had to like really sit down with myself and say like, this is what we're going to do. Like, we're going to commit to this. This is, this is who we are. This is how we approach pitching game. And because it is when you have just an ACE, it's kind of easy. Cause you just, you run them out there. And, <laughs> hey, we're going to go down with, with our ACE and that's how it's going to go. It's, it's much more like gut wrenching when you're like trying to make the right move at the right time, at the right part of the order, read the room, the situation, you know, that's, that's where the best of the best do it. And, and the best of the best is Lonnie Alameda, right? Lonnie, Lonnie has been doing this for years successfully and she's, confident in her decision making and it's not always perfect right she'd be the first one to say that sometimes you don't get it right but i'm in that i'm in that process i'm i'm early to the to that game of understanding the and having the feel but also trusting the analytics and trusting the predetermined plan that we've set for a particular game and i feel like the last two three weeks for us and our program it's really been working out it's really been it's been working and I think you look at the scores and it speaks to that. We're facing legitimate offenses and our pitchers are getting it done. Not because, you know, they're, they're again, unicorns necessarily, but because we're putting them in a position to be successful with what they do well. And for the amount of time that we believe they can do it successfully. And again, sometimes we, you know, I, I look back on this, this season, I'm like, uh, probably my, my hook was too short in that situation, or maybe I, let them go a little bit too long, but that's my growth process of understanding my personnel and who we have. And, and, and again, I think getting them even to buy in is a, is a, is a process because these are players that came from travel ball where they pitched through, not only did they pitch seven innings, they pitched 21 innings in a day. So they're used to just throw, 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 throw. And now we have to be more strategic about we're, we're trying to win these ball games. And in some cases against really special offenses. And I think that's, that's that's the magic and that's the future of the game and we're seeing it more and more and i really think i'm i love talking about it because i think it's evolution is all is what the world is about it's but history it's made up of human history so here we are we're, we're talking about the evolution of you know a, a inanimate object but um 
I love it. And I'm glad I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. And it's exciting. It's, it's scary, honestly, and a little nerve wracking, but I think, um, I think it gives us an edge, honestly. Uh, we got a question from uh, the chat. Uh, asking if you used to call your own games uh, when when you were a, a catcher. I did, I did. So not to say that that doesn't happen anymore, but I, it's definitely much more rare now than it was, let's not say how many years ago it was that I played, but it's been, it's been a few. Um, that was more common, I think, back then. Um, I think now with the amount of information that coaches have, and, um, and I think the pressures honestly are, are, are high in terms of the wins and losses and things like that. So, so more coaches have that, have that happening from the dugout. But, um, one thing that I try to do, um, with our program and our staff is over the course of the season is like giving them opportunities. Like, Hey, you take this in, like you guys go call this, or even in the middle of an inning, sometimes like if I feel like I'm not in a groove with a pitcher where like, maybe she's shaking me off a little bit. I'm like, Hey, and I just point out there, I'm like, Hey, you guys, you guys got this and then get them back in a rhythm, get them back. Cause they, they might be seeing something I'm not seeing and, and building that trust with them between them and also in themselves. Like, Hey, yeah, we actually, you know, we're seeing the game too. And, and we're, we're understanding what we're trying to do here. So, so as a player, I got to call a game. Um, you know, I think that we're, we're moving in that direction in some ways. Callie Decker is phenomenal. Our catcher, um, she actually has a really good head for the game. And and so I, I feel totally good about giving them that, giving them that opportunity. Um, not always, but in certain situations, in certain moments, I'm like, Hey, you guys have a feel like go for it. And, and giving them that, that ability to do, but um, it's not, it's not as common as it once was for sure. And speaking of Callie Decker, I, in, we, I know we just talked about her as a catcher, but in terms of her offensive production in the past couple of games here, uh, and then you've know, got Kelly Decker and a Mac Barbara I, I'm looking down the list of the roster. Uh, talk to about the impact uh, that and how you've been able to integrate transfers uh, into this program and, and uh, have them succeed. Uh, and whereas maybe they didn't see as much su success at their previous programs, but how are you getting them to succeed here at San Diego State? I think, you know, that every, every story is a little bit unique. It has its own kind of plot twists and things of how they ended up in San Diego and, and in our program. But I, I think the real key is, you know, our, the culture of our program and giving them, empowering them to have ownership and have a stake, have a stake in the, in the organization, really, you know, it's yes, you know, as a, as the head coach and my staff, you know, we're, we're sort of the, the puppeteers, if you will, right. Like we're, 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 we're creating the, we're creating the conditions for them to go write their own stories. And, you know, like Callie Decker as an example, you know, she got some opportunities in Florida, but they were, they were, you know, here and there, they were pinch hit. They were, and I don't think she ever believed that she was believed in. And that's, that's so much of it is giving them your belief. Hey, you're going to come in and you're going to change the face of this program. I believe that you can do that. The talent was there, the talent for her, the talent for Mac Barber, the talent for Allie Light. They, they possess that. We didn't give them that. We just like allowed it to be unlocked. And, um, you know, I think that there's challenges within that, right? You have new people coming and going and it's, you know, building continuity is tough. And so I think the fall, the last couple of falls where we've, you know, it's, it's tough because we're bringing in new people and we're, we're integrating new, new voices and new perspectives and all that. But, you know, when we get to this point, um, the, the, the talent was never in question. That's why they were the places they were at before. It's more of, can, can they be put in a, a position to be successful? And I don't know what it is about, about what we're doing, but something's working and um, just seeing them flourish and, and find that confidence that actually I am as good as I thought I was. Cause you know, I think when you go somewhere as a big recruit and then you don't have that success, there's this, there's this little voice on your shoulder kind of questioning like, well, maybe I'm really not that good, you know, like, I thought I was a stud. I thought when I went to Oklahoma, I thought when I went to Florida, I thought when I went that I was going to just go be this big superstar. And then when I'm not, it's like, they, you start to question yourself. And so to see that kind of that be released and just see them go out and play the way that the world knew they could is it's awesome. It's beautiful. And I'm so excited to hear you talk about that. I, I think you're right on the money. I think that that's, that's the way the world is right now. You know, the, 
just the way that college sports has become, it's so important to, to build people up uh, and make them realize how valued, how valued they are wherever they are. Um, last thing for me, before we let you go, you mentioned earlier that you feel like you've got a shot this weekend in Salt Lake City against Utah. A Utah team is playing really well, but so are you to get through the Los Angeles uh, little fight that you saw this past weekend. What do you want to see from your team in a moment like this in supers on the road, obviously for a lot of people to be the biggest moments of their softball lives. What do you want to see from them intangibly in those games? Yeah. I mean, it goes back to kind of what I said earlier about, you know, I want them to enjoy the moment and, you know, and I've said this before and Terry, you'll laugh when I say this, but you know, the 60 feet and turn left mantra, like, <laughs> This is, it really is. It's like, you know, we talked about the Hoosiers the movie, the Hoosiers, you know, right. Where they bring out the tape measure and they measure the, the basket and they measure the sidelines and they measure, this is softball, you know, and, and the stage is, is bigger and the lights are brighter and there's more hoopla and, and all of that. And, and, but it's also like, this is, this is what it's fun. This is the fun time. So I feel like if we can, if we can bring a, a loose, uh, kind of underdog mentality because we are the underdogs. We're totally the underdogs. And that is, as anyone would tell you, is actually a very awesome place to be. <laughs> it's an awesome place to be because no one expects this. We're, we're playing with house money. We're playing with house money. And so whatever happens from here on out, does not mean that we don't care? Does it mean that we don't believe? But also like the pressure of expectation. And I have to say yesterday, I felt like there, I did feel we were it, when you when you have to only win only win one game, it kind of is a weird thing because it's like it's awesome we only have to win one game, but then it's like, oh my god! But then what if we don't? Like what if they beat us twice and we and we poop the bed? You know, like Ooh. so. There's you know that like that's the reality of the feeling. You don't want that. You know, it's just it's there too. So this weekend we are not we don't have any pressure on us other than what we may put on ourselves. Um, but I think if we can enjoy the moment and really just be present and, and trust each other and have a hell of a hell of a time, fun, have fun. That's what we've been doing the last three weeks and it's been working. And, um, you know, Utah is a team that, you know, I, I'm starting to get into the, to the nitty gritty of kind of what they do. And, you know, they are chaos inducing, they run the bases, they push the envelope, they pitch, you know, they, they don't hit like a ton of power. I mean, obviously they have some power, but. It's more of just like the the make you work. They're gonna they're gonna play short game. They're gonna challenge you in all those ways. And so it, it comes down to emotionally as much as anything. Do you get rattled? If you get rattled, you know, game set match, right? Like they're gonna they're gonna come in and just and they're and they're gonna they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna hand us our, our tails. But if we can just play <laughs> relaxed and confident, even in the chaos. Um anything can happen. And that's the cool thing about the getting, I feel like the regional is a little bit more almost stacked against the underdog than the super regional. It's like two out of three, we got to prepare for one team and you know, anything can happen. Um, elevation is wild. You know, we play in elevation in our conference. So that in Utah is another factor that I, I, you know, we're used to dealing with is kind of can sometimes be a game changer. Obviously they have a huge park, so it's not so much of a home run park, but, um, Anyway, bottom line is we're going to compete and and we're going to enjoy it and really soak it in because yeah, this this is going to be the highlight of of most of their careers. And then the thought of going beyond this is again continual cherry on top. You know, we're already playing with house money, but it just gets better and better as as this, this thing goes along. Love it. Could talk to you all day long, maybe. Yeah. Stacy Newman Denise. She's also a gold medalist. I don't know if we, we I don't even put that in the open. Uh, but a long list of accomplishments and congratulations to you, the squad, the staff, and everybody at San Diego State. Uh, what a run! And and excited to watch you all play this weekend in Salt Lake City. Thank you. I think it's gonna be a I think it's gonna be a battle for sure. So looking forward to it. Go Aztecs. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. It is San Diego State head coach Stacy Newman Denise, and now Tara. We've got we're in for a real treat. We've got two cleanup hitters. We have batted around <laughs> the lineup just like Washington did right in the seventh <laughs> inning yesterday against McNeese. A wonderful transition to Silent Rain Espinoza from the Washington Huskies. Silent Rain, welcome to the D1 Softball Podcast. Congratulations 
on just a remarkable comeback last night to advance the Supers. Oh, Maybe can she hear can't us? hear us. Silent Rain, can you hear us? <laughs> well, we'll wait. I think oh, she can't hear. Um, let's figure out how we can get her some audio. Or, oh, we'll have Kelly uh, work on that at the we'll moment. Wait just a moment. Uh, <laughs> Hang tight, Silent Rain. We'll, we'll, just yeah, we'll get her back on here. We'll we'll get her in here. Um, how about Stacy Newman Denise Newby? She's just the best, isn't she? Oh my gosh, are you kidding? I was just like <clears throat> writing down quotes and the, so many things that she said that I think apply to so much. I love what she said about the transfer portal, and I think in today's society, just just the way it is, uh, you've got to you've got to provide affirmations nowadays. You've got to let people know, and, and people should do this more anyway. Mm -hmm. You got to let people know what they mean and what they're capable of and mm -hmm. that you believe in them. And I really, really enjoyed everything that she said about that. I also thought her pitching nuggets were phenomenal. And I'll tell you what, I mean, I, we're probably not going to pick any of the super regionals this weekend, but she's <laughs> exactly right. San Diego state has a shot. Why not them? Well, and I love, she's like, yeah, we're playing with house money at this point. Um, and that's coming from Stacey Newman Denise, who historically has played on, obviously, arguably the best teams in the world. So um, just incredible to see her mind and how she's grown and evolved uh, as a head coach at San Diego State. And, and really, I'm not surprised. We saw San Diego State just a season ago uh, put up a, a huge fight uh, in Arizona, at Arizona State. So that program and what she's been able to do in her time as a head coach there has really turned around and uh, for them to be heading to supers, uh, you know, shows you they're putting in the work, work there. Um, and we're going to try and see if we can get silent rain back on here. Do we know if we can, she can hear us? Not yet, but we're, we're still working okay. on it. I, I see somebody in the comments <laughs> saying, come on, you have to pick the supers. I am not going to get baited into another incorrect prediction. So I am not, I am not making any picks today. No picks from Gray. Every pick I have made has been incorrect. We're done. We will just watch the softball, Tara. Uh, your your bracket is officially busted, like everybody else's, which they should be updated on the site. We're working on making sure that those uh, points are updated on your bracket challenge. So let us know. You can send us a tweet uh, and or get on Twitter and let us know what what how many points that you've you've earned in your brackets thus far. Uh, so here we go. I think we've got her. We've got, we finally yep. got silent rain. I think so. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Come on. I'm glad you can Sorry, hear no. us. Oh, you're fine. Don't worry about it. We, we've got to, we've got to talk about this game last night. What a, what a crazy, insane comeback. Seven runs in the seventh inning to beat McNeese seven, six and go to supers. First off, welcome to the show. Second off, How's your heart after all that happened last night? Honestly, it's a little um, spiked still from last night, and I apologize for my voice. Um, but how could you not lose it after a game like last night? But, yeah, it was definitely hard going to sleep last night. But And Silent Rain, what was that moment like? Obviously being down uh, six runs uh, late in the game and, and – you know, on it, being in that position and back against the wall, what was that mentality like for the team and to kind of get that rally started? I, I know that can be a tough position to be in and, and one that I think across the country I'd already, you know, written McNeese and, and on their brackets uh, at that point. I, I did uh, in the sixth inning, Gray, but Silent Rain, what was that like in the sixth inning and what did Coach Tar say to y'all uh, before that, that at bat? Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, I went out on defense in the bottom of that sixth inning, and I was like, this just doesn't feel right, you know? It doesn't feel right that this is going to be my last time, you know, playing defense on this field. And I remember I walked off after that third out, and I was second at bat. I was the second one to come up um, in that top of the seventh inning, and or the third one, actually. And I was like, after Maddie got that hit and Jalen got that hit, I was like, all right, we just need to keep passing the bat, you know? Um, and I remember looking at Bailey and we were in the dugout and she was like, 
we can do this. Like, we still got game left, you know, we still got three outs. So I think just not ever, you know, writing down McNeese on that card. And during the fourth inning, we had fans leaving. And I was like, where is everyone going? Like, come on now. Like, um, but yeah, just not ever giving up, you know, nothing was going our way in the first game or the first couple of innings of that second game. But, you know, we were telling ourselves like balls are going to drop, like something's going to happen. And all the balls that needed to drop dropped in that seventh inning. So yeah, it was awesome. Sal Arena, I want to ask about what, what I thought was the biggest takeaway from, from the entire night. And that was the post-game interview with Heather Tarr. Uh, she was, she was very emotional in that interview and it was so awesome to see the team surround her in that moment. I think one of the best images of the entire weekend, what does coach Tarr mean to you and and why did the team respond like that? I mean, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a team do that with a head coach during an interview. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of love on our team and, between us girls and between us coaches and it's all about trust you know if we trust our coaches and if we trust our players then we can do anything and we proved that last night you know um I gave coach Tara a hug after that interview and she was just telling me like there's a reason why you know there's a reason why that we're not done yet and we have more to more to accomplish and more to prove to ourselves and everyone else so And Sally Rain, I obviously uh, some celebrations, hopefully a post game uh, last night. Uh, what does the week look like for you and the Washington Huskies uh, getting ready for Supers? Yeah, you know, trying to just decompress from last night. My heart rate is still up, like you said, but, you know, just getting back to neutral and getting back to preparing for what's ahead. You know, you can't count out any team. And we're excited for just to see how good we can get. And, any team that we're going to play is just a team standing in our way. So just knowing that and knowing that at least we get to play at home, which is exciting. And hopefully our fans don't leave early. <laughs> you tell them silent rain, tell them right now, tell them. I know there was, don't leave early. There was a little bit of rain, but come on now we're from Seattle. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so just preparing, taking any game, like, it's a normal game, not putting too much pressure on ourselves, but just taking it game by game. So, I did want to ask about the pitching staff as well, Silent Rain, especially Brooke Nelson, who who finished it off. And really, if you look kind of up and down the story of the game, there were a lot of people who were potentially playing the last bit of softball in a Washington uniform last night who came up big. What can you say about the pitchers? What can you say about – your, your senior class and the leadership that was displayed last night in that comeback? I mean, Brooke pitched, pitched her butt off, you know. I texted her last night and I was just like, I'm so freaking proud of you. And she was like, if you guys can score seven, seven runs in one inning, like I could get you three outs, you know. So just like saying that out loud gives me chills, you know, just knowing that those are the types of players that we have on this team and she's going to do whatever she can and come in and, pitch her butt off and do it for us, you know, and then our senior class just pulling up that last inning, you know, there was our, we went through the lineup almost twice and just knowing that all of our seniors, that was possibly their last at bat in Husky stadium and last at bat ever, just knowing that. And we all came out and did what we had to do. And Sammy Reynolds with the bases clearing uh double. Oh, what, when that happened, what what was what were you feeling, and what was it like at home plate? Because I think watching it was just incredible. But uh, what were you feeling in that moment? I mean, you can't even describe like how proud and how like it brought tears to my eyes. And I look at Sam on second, and she has tears in her eyes, and she's like covering her face. And you know, it just makes you cry because you're like, damn, like we're not out, like we, can <laughs> just being so proud of my teammates and just seeing how how good of softball players they are, but knowing like how good of people they are and how much work we put in, just seeing it finally come out at the right time is just, it's awesome. It's, you can't describe the feeling. 
Last thing for me, Silent Rain. So we talked about the Super Regional. You're hosting Louisiana coming up this weekend. The prep will begin very soon. But in the early stages, what do you know about the Cajuns and what excites you about this matchup? I honestly know nothing. I was asking um, a couple of my teammates last night in the locker room just if they like what they know. And um, we don't know a lot as players just because we're so far from them, you know, <laughs> um, and we're trying to worry about our own thing. But I know that they're – what I've heard is they're a very similar team to us, you know, scrappy, um, can hit, can get the job done, can pitch and play defense. But um, we just got to see who can score more runs, you know, and worry, worry more about ourselves and how we're going to play our game and stick to our process rather than trying to get outside and worry too much about the opponent. So – all right, well, that's it for me. Silent Rain Espinoza, uh, Washington Huskies. Go dogs. Yes. Uh, Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks for joining Thanks for us joining on us. the U.S. Softball Podcast, Silent Rain. Thank you. Bye. Well, that was delightful. Silent Rain Espinoza, ladies and gentlemen. I got, like, chills, like, twice, I think, during her when, interview. When she said the Brooke Nelson text, if you guys can score seven runs for me, I can get three outs for you, put it on a shirt. Come on. That's amazing. <laughs> Incredible. I mean, and she, I was so cute. She lost her voice. I mean, I, I probably, same thing. Like, they you'd probably same. been screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have people well, not seen heck? Twitter. Of course, I was <laughs> screaming. What a heck of a performance! And and that is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and to come back uh, in the way in the way that they did, that's the type of belief that will push you forward. We talked about belief earlier, and and sixteen we believe that's the type of belief that a team uh, can can kind of put in their little basket and use moving forward through supers. Uh, but yeah, that'll be good. They are similar teams. It's funny that she said that. They are pretty similar teams, Gray. Yeah, I think that's just going to be fascinating. And, I mean, we can look a little bit closer at the Baton Rouge Regional while we're at it uh, as we finish looking at the bracket, and then we'll wrap this baby up. Thank you to everybody who stayed yeah. with us here on the D1 Softball yeah. Podcast presented by S2 Cognition. Uh, Tara, Baton Rouge got weird on Sunday. Louisiana, a comeback win, and then another comeback win. Uh, Sydney Brazon, the freshman in the circle for LSU, just just had some struggle moments um, in, in that second game, including when they were trying to intentionally walk a batter. And the Cajuns, after years of, I think, being the pick to get out of regionals and not doing it, finally they're able to get back to supers. Well, it was, it was interesting. I did an interview, I think, last week and and mentioned Louisiana and how they might be a little bit saucy not hosting because I think they believe that they should have been hosting uh, a regional. And so to see to see them double dip and, and take two from the Tigers, I actually wasn't surprised. But in the way they do it, like you said, uh, you know, two attempted on in, or intentional walks. I think, you know, that's tough. And um you know, back and forth, putting six runs up in the in the first, a grand slam, uh, I believe Jordan Campbell grand slam. Uh, Carly Heath doing a nice job for Louisiana. Uh, Maya Davis as well. But Scrappy, you're right. Like, she she, she said it perfectly, Silent Lane Espinoza. Scrappy squad. But, you know, even the, the controversial Georgia Clark home run uh, over the foul pole, they couldn't judge it because it's too high over the foul pole is what I heard. That's that's what the word seems to be, which I mean, again, <laughs> man, we need higher foul poles, right? I guess. I don't know why we keep having to talk about calls, <laughs> but it seems like so many regionals were dependent on calls and zones. And there was an ejection in game two of Georgia Clark. Um, but yeah, make the foul yes. pole higher. That would seem that would seem like an easy fix. It is an easy fix, but then you're looking at costs and money and programs across the country having to, you know, obviously replace their foul poles. But maybe it's a stipulation to host, right? Like if your foul pole is not at a certain height, you can't host a regional. Maybe. I don't, I, I don't 
I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, but it was just a wild series down in Baton Rouge. And I think we were all waiting for that uh, Louisiana McNeese matchup and, and getting ready to, to head down there. But, you know, again, Washington spoiled, spoiled that, that party they were going to have down there. And um, again, Louisiana hats off to Jerry Glasgow uh, and, and that squad because to come back and win two, that's difficult to do. Uh, and uh, they, they just happened to do it. Absolutely. And and for LSU, really tough end of the year, second straight season, they don't get out of regionals. And uh, there, I'm sure, is going to be a lot of discussion in Baton Rouge about how to make sure that that doesn't happen again next year. You know, and someone asked me a really interesting question on Twitter about intention, uh, intentional walks and, and just saying, hey, f- you know, four balls and, and having the, the runner take their base as they do uh, in MLB now and internationally. So uh, an interesting one because that that was huge. And who got the base hit? Uh, and during the intentional walk too, just the ball around the zone. I think practicing uh, intentional walks is something that that has to happen uh, if it's going to stay a part of our game. But that was a huge turning point uh, in game two. Yeah, it's so interesting. I remember I chatted with Sydney Little John Watkins about it on one of our TV broadcasts. How it's really difficult as a righty pitcher to try and intentionally walk a righty batter because it's such a sideways motion and it's not something that feels natural, but either way, I will say this: Sydney Brazon is the future. And I know that yesterday was not the NCAA tournament performance that she wanted, but she's going to do big things for the Tigers in her career. Oh, absolutely. And, and she had an incre- incredible, uh, rookie campaign, uh, for the Tigers. So again, uh, we're going to see a ton of, of Sydney Burzon and what she was able to do, uh, like you said, as a, as a freshman. I don't think this is obviously the last of her, but that's going to make the Tigers going to, I think they're going to be a little hungry he- heading into the season next year. Cause that one, that's a tough pill to swallow uh, dropping two uh, on a, on a final day. You'd argue that's a worse way to lose than going 0 and two. I don't know. What mm. do you think, Ray? I both, well, I almost found out both would be really, <laughs> really hard. <laughs> Uh, let's go to uh, to the section right above Washington, Louisiana, which is Oregon and Oklahoma State. Oregon, an unseeded team coming out of the Fayetteville Regional. And coming out of the Fayetteville Regional, Tara is almost underselling it. The Ducks demolished the Fayetteville Regional. I mean, barely a sweat broken because of how strong that offense was all weekend long. Oh, they were absolutely incredible. Great. I mean, it was like... They couldn't be beat, the the Oregon Ducks. And Ariel Carlson uh, with a walk-off grand slam. I just, you know, we've talked about the Ducks, I think, throughout the last couple of podcasts. And, again, they were on, you know, 14-game winning streaks, and they they dropped the series to Utah. And uh, But that offense, uh, high-powered offense, and and Stevie Hansen uh, and Morgan Scott and Reagan Breedlove, what they've been able to do in the circle for the Ducks, uh, simply, what a statement. Like what an offensive statement by Oregon, uh, just absolutely obliterating, uh, like you said, that regional uh, and fun to watch too. It's really fun to watch. Yeah. Oregon, you know, we've talked about it. I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could pick them because I, I didn't trust them. And this weekend I, I found a lot of trust in the ducks. They just, they just do it. They just absolutely do it. And their offense is powerful. Their pitching staff is certainly very good. Uh, maybe not quite shut down, but they do the job necessary to let the offense come through on the other side. Mm-hmm. And to demolish Arkansas like they did was a gigantic statement to me. Arkansas, a really, really disappointing showing in this home regional after falling in supers the last two years. A lot of people were saying, this is the year, OKC. And to not even uh, be in the, the catbird seat in the winner's bracket regional championship on Sunday and then to not force an if game just – a really disappointing finish for a good Arkansas squad this year. Yeah, 20, 29 runs the Oregon Ducks scored uh, in that at regional on the weekend. But I, I agree with you, Gray. And I look back to my notes earlier in the season when I watched Arkansas and just my notes said, hey, they're not a top 10 team. Uh, and I, I and just didn't, I, whereas you were saying people are saying this was their year, I think that they were, I thought they were going to struggle early on and just watching them just weren't, weren't quite gelling, had some, you know, missing pieces. Uh, Shanice Dells uh, earlier in the season was having trouble locating the zone. I mean, obviously coming back through the SEC, um, 
season and conference play, uh, she put it together. But, you know, Hannah Gamble, uh, again, I saw a few balls uh, at, on defense kind of go through her legs, on, but I, I, then she comes back and hits a three-run bomb. So you're like, oh, you're, you could do that if you come back and hit a three-run bomb. You know, I'm, I'm totally fine with that, right? Um, but, you know, just a little bit shaky, uh, I think, uh, across the board for Arkansas. And Oregon just looked poised, uh, sharpened, ready uh, to just go in and take that regional. And there is a comment in there. Yes, I think being sent to Arkansas last year and in Oregon losing uh, to the Razorbacks really, uh, again, I think they were hungry heading into there and ready to take that regional. Absolutely. And uh, again, Arkansas, they'll be back. Very young team this year. They'll have a chance next season. Right above Florida State and Georgia is coming up this weekend. That'll be Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So mark your calendars Thursday night, folks. That's going to be awesome. A uh, Florida State coming out of a Tallahassee regional. It felt like history was repeating itself. Florida State against South Carolina on Sunday. Remember last year, we've talked about it. Florida State lost in regionals, but they lost to Mississippi State, who did not who they did not play on Saturday in the winner's bracket game a season ago. That was South Florida. This year, they played Central Florida on the Saturday game. Sunday, they were matched up with South Carolina, and the Gamecocks won game one. And then Kat Sandercock said, this is where the sadness ends. A perfect <laughs> game to beat the Gamecocks one nothing and send the Seminoles to Supers, Terra. That is leadership in the circle right there from Sandercock, and obviously phenomenal success. I mean, were you surprised that Kat didn't start game one? Because I was. I was really surprised to see Ali Dubois in the circle. But uh, again, I feel like Lonnie just, Lonnie Alameda knows these, almost like I feel like she has a crystal ball and she like knows these things are going to happen. Like she knew that that was probably good for her team to, to lose game one. And uh, and Kat Sandercock was going to come in and shut the door and throw a perfect game. Because that's sometimes what it feels like. It feels like Lonnie is on this different softball planet where she she could kind of see this macro view of what her team needs but huge win again a huge win for uh the seminoles and you know we have an article on the website uh, that talks about cat sandercock and and graham hayes is it, literally breaking down lonnie alameda and her pitching staff and her pitching style and using difference but cat talked about how much that hurt uh, a season ago, you know, being eliminated by Mississippi State. And gosh, what a performance uh, for uh, the Seminoles. Uh, fun to watch. And and this is going to be a fun super too, Gray. I'm telling you what, it's going to be a blast because Georgia was just mashing in Athens. The reason I never considered picking Virginia Tech was, and we talked about this, the amount of home runs that they have been allowing. But even still... I did not expect for the Bulldogs to hit as many bombs as they did in this regional. Their offense was just immaculate, Tara. Oh, the ball just left the yard uh, almost every inning, it felt like. And Sydney Shambly, I, I mean, ha have a weekend. Uh, are, you, are you kidding me? She was seven for nine. She had four bombs. Uh, on the weekend uh, for Georgia, uh, just f four for four yesterday in the final game uh, and 13 RBIs uh, on the weekend. Uh, can't say enough about Shelby Walters. I think that was a huge pickup for Georgia because we were concerned about their pitching staff, I think, heading into this season and huge pickup, the transfer. She only threw in six games just in a go for Duke. So to step in um, and add another viable arm for the Georgia Bulldogs with that high scoring offense, you, you know, you take a look at FSU uh, and their lack of run, run production in the regionals. And then you look at, at Georgia, which is the exact opposite. It's almost like, you know, what are we? I'm excited. Cat Sandercock versus that Georgia offense and Sydney Chambly and Jada Kearney and Sarah Mosley and the whole. Uh, whoo. There's a reason it was picked for Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That is prime time Thursday night ESPN two. I'm sure whichever television crew is going there is uh, going to be one of the top tier ones. I mean, every everything is going to be phenomenal in Tallahassee. Can't wait. Uh, the last one, I believe, right, to talk about is uh, Texas and Tennessee, which is getting the Friday, Saturday, Sunday treatment. And, you know, keep your eye on uh, on some of the trades when it comes to this series. It begins Friday on ESPN2. Texas comes out of Austin. 
certainly not an easy regional on Friday and Saturday for most people. Texas uh, got the combined no hitter against Seton Hall. A tight game with the Aggies on winner's bracket Saturday and then Sunday. Uh, Texas scored early and scored often and kind of blew it open. Yeah. And, you know, obviously Mac Morgan has been the ace for uh, the Longhorns done a nice job, but Sophia Simpson coming in and, and Estelle check uh, adding some, some viable arms and uh, sit Lolly Gutierrez. They've got a lot of options in the circle. Uh, Texas does, but their middles, I can't say enough about the, the, the rookie class there and that freshman class at Texas, because again, another team, which I think has a good mix, uh, good, none of, no pun intended, uh, in Lee and good, uh, and, uh, Viviana Martinez, uh, it's just, you know, again, wasn't an easy regional. And I think Texas A&M, we saw a team that a season ago, I don't think we would have seen a team play like that. I put up a fight. Like they were in run rule uh, territory at one point to come back and the game ends 10-5 uh, and to stay, stay in that that game. Uh, you, you can't say never what, what Trisha Ford did with the Aggies this season uh, to advance to the regional final uh, in her first season in the SEC. Yeah, absolutely. Down to your final out in the first game against Texas State and just finding a way. Uh, bad mistake by the Bobcats, but you know what good teams do is they take advantage of mistakes. Tom and I are starting to call those points off turnovers, and uh, Texas A&M was able to thrive on that in the Austin yeah. Regional. But Texas gets out, and the Longhorns will face Tennessee in Supers in Knoxville. Tennessee, look, this was almost a Monday end, but – the Lady Vols were able to win the Sunday championship game against Indiana 7-3. to For for the home team, you know, a lot of teams have goals and regionals besides just getting out and going to Supers. One of Tennessee's, I'm sure, was try and get out of this regional without Ashley Rogers having to throw more than once, and that's what happened. And this Tennessee squad, Gray, I, I mean, we've talked about it all season long. You and I think are on the same page uh, with this, but – a, a, ta- a squad that has obviously Kiki Malloy, uh, who you'd argue maybe at this point you, you men- we talked about player of the year candidates. Maybe those were announced too early because Kiki Malloy is, you know, could have, could have, should have maybe been on that list uh, if we want to talk about that, but that's another, another time. Uh, and then Zadie, Zeta Pooney uh, on that offense. I don't think we, we talk about her enough, but you know, that pitching staff, Ashley Rogers, she's been able to be rested this season and, and in seasons past that hasn't been the case so for Peyton Gottschall again the transfer to come in and, and eat up those innings and then Carlin Pickett's which we see got she got some work in uh in that final inning game up a few runs they're gonna need her heading into uh supers and just even if it's for a few batters uh it, it's good to see Karen work her in there and maybe work through some some things that she's been going through but this is a tough Tennessee squad and gonna be a tough go for Texas especially uh when they'll have that home field advantage uh, in Knoxville. Absolutely. I think that is a, a, such a great series. Texas, Tennessee, Florida State, Georgia, they jump off the page. Uh, Tara, mm. we're, we're about to wrap up the show. Thank you again to everybody who's been <laughs> tuning in. Um, but I, I wanted to These ask you. getting longer and longer. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, it's postseason. Sorry, it's postseason. What do we do? Uh, I'm going to ask for one bold prediction. I'm not going to make you pick any supers, but what's one bold prediction for this weekend? Ooh, bold prediction. Um, I actually, it's. Uh, I think San Diego State's going to be in the Women's College World Series. I love it. I'm. I, I do. I. I'm still. I'm still trying to decide. But I'll tell you what. I yeah, heard a, which is. I heard a pretty good pitch earlier from a certain head coach to pick the Aztecs. I mean, I just think. I think it can happen. I. I really do. I do think that there's an ability for for San Diego State to get get through that uh, Salt Lake City Regional. That you asked for bold. That's probably my boldest uh, prediction. Yeah, I think two two SEC teams are going to be in the Women's College World Series. I just haven't figured out which two. I think they'll be. Um, I'm I'm look. I think Georgia's got a great shot against Florida State. Yeah. I think Texas has That's a great shot to upset Tennessee and knock them off in Knoxville and Alabama Northwestern. There are so many question marks because I'm still not totally sure about the status of Montana Fouts. So I, I Wait, think getting, there will be. You see, we're getting, 
Go ahead. What? Sorry. I, I was just saying, I, I, I think two SEC teams will be in OKC, but I just, I haven't decided which two they'll be yet. More on that later this week, I'm sure. Are you looking at the chat? That's why I, I... what? Oh, here, hold on a second. You want to pull you? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to completely ignore how bad you botch the Stillwater regional picks? Nope, not going to do it. We're, we're not going to ignore. It. We're going to talk about it. Uh, Let me put it up here. Our in, yeah, there we go. Uh, our entire staff did pick Wichita State to get out of the the Stillwater regional, and the Cowgirls. They proved us wrong, Gray. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, too, I wasn't even on the graphic, and I'm being lumped in here, but I, too, picked Wichita State to come out of that regional. And, yeah, I was wrong because it's postseason softball, and if you go 100% correct, then I am taking you to Vegas right now. Um, <laughs> look, I, I'm going to be honest. I, I think Let's there, talk about the cowgirls. Well, yeah, go. We should. I think there's something to be said about how – the two mid-major darlings, the two popular picks, Wichita State and Central Arkansas, by a lot of people, not just people at D1, a lot of people had that. Uh, they were gone by Saturday. And there were some, There were some. again, I know you don't like the word mid-majors, but there were some under-the-radar mid-majors that a lot of people weren't talking about. And I think that that's a mistake that I certainly will not make again. I, I felt like I, I got into the hype a little bit with Wichita State. And uh, to Oklahoma State's credit, um, I mean that comeback against Nebraska. I can't. I can't decide if Nebraska loves or hates the seventh inning of games because every seventh <laughs> inning involving the Huskers was dramatic in some capacity. And I must say, I, you know, we saw the Cowgirls go through struggles, obviously towards the end of the season, and gonna go on a huge slide. But the greatest thing about the postseason is it is a new season, uh, and so you can take what you learned and you can. Uh, take that and and go into a, a regional like Stillwater. And you'd argue that because people did count them out, that probably made them play a little bit better. Would have made me play a little bit better when people are counting us out, you know, choosing Wichita State over, uh, you know, a six seed, a six seed in Stillwater. Uh, I would have been the same way, but can't say enough about Kenny Gajewski and what he did to turn that team around because – that was a slippery slope, Gray, and for them to win those games in the in the manner that they did, showing grit, uh, ability to score runs, grind it out, that was that was impressive to see. So again, we might be seeing a switch of this Cowgirls team that we saw in the in the beginning of the season uh, towards the end, and that's exactly what you want. You want your team playing uh, their best ball towards the end of the season. Right. And uh, again, finding a way to win that Nebraska game, I think in particular to make sure that yeah. the if necessary game was not necessary, big, big confidence booster. Yeah. And if you're Oklahoma state, not only are you hosting a super, uh, but you're hosting an unseated team. Now to be fair, again, we've talked about Oregon playing really well, but if you're the cowgirls, you've got to be thrilled with how this is kind of working out for you. Uh, you know, a six seed. Yes, we we're shocked that uh, Oklahoma State got that that six seed. But in the driver's seat to to head back to the Women's College World Series yet again, and we know a season ago, heartbreaker uh, in that semifinal game against Texas. And you'd argue, I mean, I'd argue that Oklahoma State should have been in that champ series game. And I think they'd say the same thing. So again, a good position for the Cowgirls to be in, heading into supers. Yeah, and that is the other Thursday, Friday, Saturday super, by the way. So Thursday night, 9 o'clock Eastern time, ESPN2, Oklahoma State, Oregon. I love it. It's going to be fun. How about that Thursday night? Georgia, Florida State, Oklahoma State, Oregon. It, it's going to be – I mean, what what a weekend. You have the schedule, right, Gray? I do, I've yes. i schedule. Yeah. Well, you give the people what they want. Okay. So here we go. Uh, we'll go just all over, starting top left. Oklahoma Clemson uh, is Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday at 2 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN2. And a reminder, Times TBD for Game 3s, Television Network's TBD on Games 2 and 3, although uh, announcement should be coming very, very soon. Stanford Duke Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Friday is at 12 noon Eastern time on ESPN2. Alabama Northwestern Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Friday night at the Rhodes House, 8 p.m. Eastern time on ESPNU, Texas, Tennessee, Friday, 
4 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN2. Uh, you've got Florida State, Georgia, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You've got Oregon, Oklahoma State, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Just touched on that. Washington, Louisiana, Friday at 10 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN2. And Utah, San Diego State, Friday at 10 p.m. Eastern time on ESPNU. Make sure that you check your local listings and social media and all that for the television network selections for games two and three of all of these supers. And here's a beautiful graphic that uh, our gal Kelly Hickby put together for you all. So we'll put this up on social. Make sure you you save it, tweet it out, and, and let us know who your picks are for the weekend. I mean, Gray and I just had to do it. Well, did we do it? We didn't even do it. We'll, we'll save it for oh, later. We're not doing it? No. Oh, well, you know what? I'll tweet them out. We're gonna, I'm going to tweet my picks out with a graphic. So you all can grab that graphic and tweet out your picks. Uh, and then maybe we'll just put you up here uh, on the chat next week uh, when, you're, when your picks are wrong. Or maybe, or maybe when they're right. <laughs> How do you feel about that? I think that's kind of fun. Uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, am I in this graphic? I I don't know. I am i don't know if now is the time for me to start being in picks after how badly last week went. <laughs> yeah. And thank you to the chat. You know, sometimes there's a lot to things to cover. So we're totally fine with you guys telling us if we miss something. So that's why you're here. We appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah, there there is a lot going on. Again, this paper, very, very busy. And I'm glad that we're able to cover all of the regionals. I think we got them all. Did we not, Tara? We got them. We okay, got them all. beautiful. Oh, they'll let us know if we didn't. Uh, that's true. Before we, uh, before we ship out, Tara, let the people know what's on D1 this week ahead of Super Regionals. Oh, my goodness. There's so much on D1. And also... If you're not a subscriber, you should be. It's not really that expensive, and you can get all the content heading into the Women's College World Series. Uh, we've got Regional Central. Obviously, you can go back and take a look at what everything everything that happened uh, in the, the regionals this past weekend, and we'll have Super Regional Central for you as well. So everything happening across the country uh, in Division One softball. Obviously, our scoreboard, you can head on over to the who's playing win uh, and at what time, and our win probability chart. So if you go over to the scoreboard, there's a win probability chart on there, so you can see – uh, what the win probability is of a game. I think we might actually have a cool one on here of that Washington. Yeah, let me uh, let me flash that. Yeah, so this is the win probability of McNeese winning uh, the game in the bottom. Or the, look, let's look at the top of the seventh here. Uh, we're looking at a eight. I think that's like a eighty nine percent. I can't scroll on it, but that shows you the swing and win probability, and they are free. Uh, during the post season, thanks to our friends at 643 Charge. So head on over to the site, check those out. We'll get you all ready and prepped for Super Regionals heading into the weekend. And we'll have some fun interactive stuff on there as well. Yes. And somebody in the, oh, chat, and the transfer checker. Yeah. I was oh about gosh, to say, Braden, our cool. guy, uh, it is portal season. We had a Brandon lot of job. people go in last week. And uh, I'm sure with, 48 teams and their seasons coming to an end in the past couple days, there will be a lot of movement there and uh, that will continue to be updated Tara on the D one softball website. Correct. You know, I love to hate the transfer tracker, but uh, yes, a lot of names going in there. Uh, a lot of names going in and in and out, especially at the close of the season too. Um, but it is, it is there and it is a great tool. Yes. And remember all of the uh, other Stuff that you can access on the D1 Softball website, d1softball.com, just a phenomenal URL that you should click on every single day. Uh, you can get it with the special promo code PODCAST20. That, that'll get you a 20% off of an annual subscription on the site. Okay, Tara, exhale. We've covered regionals. <laughs> we have a few days. Supers will start Thursday night. I know you're as excited as I am. I'm excited. I can't wait. I mean, we are just getting into the thick of it. This is the three, my three favorite uh, weeks of, of the season here. We're, we're almost, we're almost to the end of it, but uh, gosh, what a great time to be uh, a part of this sport. What a, what a great time to be part of women's sports and, and softball. Uh, can't say enough about just being able to see the games on, on television. I don't think we talk about that enough. And I was able to, to be uh, around the production hub this past weekend. And I don't think people realize how difficult it is to actually produce 101 games across the country. Uh, and 
how that is done and how well it's done and our access to be able to see these incredible athletes and, and access to every single inning across every single regional in, in the country. Uh, it's just from what it was gray to what it is now. Uh, it's just incredible, uh, to be a part of and, and can't say enough uh, about that and, and the ability to, to watch every single inning and what ESPN does uh, for the sport. Tip of the cap to friend of the show, Mega Ronowitz, uh, who came yeah. on. remember way back in that premiere, Tara, back when we were so young and the season was just beginning. Like I really, I, I don't think people actually understand how much work it is to get a, a, te a game televised on uh, to bring broadcast, let alone not only the talent, like we're only hearing the talent really. Uh, and we're seeing obviously uh, the game, but the amount of human beings that go into just producing one game to do 101, uh, I, I get to see on the back end what, how much work that is, but yeah, Mega Ronovitz and our squad, I uh, can't say enough about uh, what they do. I uh, was with Nick and, and Chris and, uh, and, and Kevin and Katie this weekend. Uh, it's, it's incredible. That's all I'm going to say. So, uh, give them some slack and, and everybody has their opinions. I get it, but um, give them some slack and, and say something nice because uh, I, I don't think we, we say enough nice thing, nice things about it. Well, I'll say something and, nice. I, I, I don't know about ABC uh, potentially, maybe. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to say know. something nice though, Tara. It's always a delight to podcast with you. Oh, Thanks, Gray. It's always great to chat with you. I mean, we've been talking for an hour and a half. We could keep going. <laughs> we we honestly could, but you know what? We'll just save that for next week when we're getting ready for the Women's College World Series. Yes, we will. <laughs> yes, yes, we will. What a fun one. Wow. Amazing. Thank you to our yes. wonderful guests, Silent Rain Espinoza, Stacey Newman, Denise, just absolutely great stories and nuggets of knowledge from both of those uh, amazing folks and of course kelly higby behind the scenes uh this is actually like the first show we've ever had a technical difficulty and kelly was able to handle it perfectly so kelly way to go tara one last thought before we wrap it up let's go uh we're in the postseason this is mayhem and turn on all your tvs watch some softball head on out to a game if you can if you can get to a live game there's just nothing like it uh, and hopefully you all are enjoying this and let us know if we can do more in terms of what we're providing you on d1 softball uh and gray thank you so much for for all that you do and, and making this show this show uh stay together always providing the framework but even when i'm going all over the place yeah, and, and for me, the last thing, congratulations to all the, the seniors whose careers ended this weekend. Uh, we talked about Kayla Kowalik, Megan Faramo, my friend Jordan Johnson at Central Arkansas. Oh. There are so many. Um, you know, one loss does not define your career, like you said earlier, Tara. Uh, and thank you for what all of you have brought to the sport of softball because, yes, the television side, it's helping the growth. But the fact that we've got really interesting and compelling people to talk about on these teams – are, are what help facilitates uh, that growth. And so congratulations and a tip of the cap to everybody who wrapped up their careers this weekend. Absolutely. And the cool thing now, Gray, is hopefully we'll get to see a lot of these players uh, head into the pro league and play professionally and have that opportunity to play softball professionally. And hopefully we'll not, hopefully not all of these years have quite ended uh, yet. Absolutely. That's it for the D1 Softball Podcast. Again, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you to all of our guests for joining us. Thank you to the folks behind the scenes who made this happen. For Tara Henry, I'm Gray Robertson. Super starts on Thursday. Enjoy the action. Next time we chat with you, we will know the eight teams playing in the Women's College World Series. See you then.